Uh, good morning, everyone. We were going to start Professor's, uh, Professor Kondapalli's lecture in a bit, and hopefully the others will soon start trickling in. Um, professor Kondapalli, even though he does not really need an introduction, he is a professor of Chinese studies at uh, JNU, Jawaharlal Nehru University. He has been the chairman of the Center for East Asian Studies in the School of International Studies at JNU four times, from 2008 to 2010, 2012 to 14, 2016 to 18, and 2018 to 20. He's educated in Chinese studies in India as well as in China. Uh, his PhD is in Chinese studies. He is fluent in the language, which he learned at the Beijing Language and Culture University from 1996 to 1998. He was a visiting professor at National Changshu University in Taipei in 2004. He was a visiting fellow at the China, India, China Institute for Contemporary International Relations in Beijing in May 2007. He's an honorary professor at Shantung University, Xinan. He was an uh, honorary professor in Xinan uh, in 2009, 2011, 13, 15, and 16. He's also been an honorary professor at Chilin University in uh, 2014, at Yunnan University of Finance and Economics in Kunming in 2016. He's also a non-resident senior fellow at People's University since 2014, and a fellow at the Salzburg Global Seminar in 2010. He's written multiple books, as most of you already would know that, because some of it also is in your uh, course manual. Um, but just a few of his works include uh, China's military, the PLA in transition in 1999, China's naval power in 2001. He's also written two monographs, co-edited five volumes, Asian security in China in 2004, China and its neighbors in 2010, China's military and India in 2012, China and the BRICS setting up a different kitchen in 2016, and One Belt, One Road, China's global outreach in 2017. He's written a number of articles in journals and co-edited edited volumes. All of these are on China. He writes regularly in international and national dailies. He's been quoted almost on a daily basis. Some of these include the South China Morning Post, BBC News, China Daily, the New York Times, the Guardian, the Wall Street Journal, the Indian Express, etc., etc. He's also received the K. Subramaniam Award in 2010 for excellence in research and strategic and security studies. Uh, Professor Kondapalli will deliver his lecture on China's foreign policy, determinants and dynamics. Uh, the lecture will be for an hour, which will be followed by a brief Q&A session. Uh, sir, could I please invite you to begin the talk? Uh, today's uh, discussion is on China's foreign policy. So we have uh, about 14 slides on this. Uh, there is a formal Q&A session at the end. But if there is any pressing uh, uh, doubt that you have, you just flag these and then we can clarify and then we go forward. Now, any country's foreign policy uh, is determined by. Oh, this is better. Yeah. Is there a, no, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, any country's foreign policy is determined by obviously its uh, national interest, right? Um, in terms of neorealist foreign policy posture, the national interest form the main theme. Uh, but there is also the, the, yeah, that's better, thanks. Okay. okay. Um, any country's foreign policy is determined by uh, that country's national interest. We, these are the basics in any foreign policy posture. Uh, but then we are dealing with China, which has other requirements. Uh, you see strange here that unlike in other countries, where the constitution of the, the republic forms the basis and the national interest, in any foreign policy. In the case of China, it is slightly different. 
it looks at the Communist Party's interest first. Uh, because the Communist Party came to power in 1949 with the support of the Chinese military. And the Communist Party has its own uh, agenda, has its own requirements, has its own aspirations. Um, of course, they have not been able to export communist revolution uh, as what the Soviet Union did before. But this is also one requirement. If you are a communist party, obviously you'll also have to promote communist ideology. So that's one requirement uh, that becomes a determinant as well. Uh, so what we're dealing with is, uh, say, not like India or not like other countries' foreign policy, but here there is a special feature that is the communist party's dominance. So this is one determinant we see generally in the case of China. So the aspirations, the constitutional requirements, the uh, agenda, the, um, the schemes that they have, ideology, these form the core determinant in China's foreign policy. And the Communist Party is not monolithic. Uh, even the Soviet Communist Party or even North Korean Communist Party are not monolithic in the sense that uh, if somebody has Kim Il-sung in 1945, for example, if he had uh, mentioned the um, uh, certain policies, certain, uh, these have now become uh, partly uh, rearranged or changed. Um, they, for example, Kim Il-sung had mentioned about the Juche philosophy, roughly translated as self-reliance, self, -reliance, self uh, sufficiency and so on. But today, the, uh, his grandson, who is now the ruler in North Korea, has changed several of these policies. Uh, so one of the other determinants is this dynamics. Um, all foreign policy is also about chasing the ground reality. The ground reality is shifting always in foreign policy. So the decision makers need to uh, shift some of their even while retaining their core uh, value systems uh, or core national interests. So I think with this caveat, let us discuss what these determinants are with Communist Party as the basis in China. Uh, and they have their own uh, ideology, aspirations. The Communist Party of China is different from Soviet Communist Party, the CPSU or even the North Korean Communist Party, or Vietnamese Communist Party, or Cuban Communist Party, or other Communist Parties before. Um, what, what is at the basis of the Chinese Communist Party? Uh, for this, we need to go to September 1949 common program that they evolved just before the PRC was established. They have certain positions in the common program. Common program is like the social contract between the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese people. Um, but then the Communist Party later on also had several constitutions which guided their ideology, philosophy, uh, their aspirations. Um, and then you have also the state constitution. Uh, the state constitution was uh, enacted at least four times. Uh, in 1954, 1975, 77, and the latest in 1982, but amended in 1991-92. So too many things in terms of the guiding philosophy for the Communist Party and for the PRC. Uh, to, I will explain later on what these uh, aspects are, uh, but suffice it to say here, it is the Communist Party of China which calls the shots in all walks of life in China. So that's, we need to keep that in mind before we discuss the other things. Then you have also the national interest. Uh, in general, these are related to the sovereignty and territorial integrity of that country. Uh, but strangely, for some countries, they don't look at the sovereignty and territorial integrity issues. For example, the United States doesn't mention about sovereignty, territorial integrity, right? Uh, or other countries, European countries don't mention about sovereignty and territorial integrity. 
because uh, after the Westphalia Treaty, when they have defined the borders, uh, by the 1960s and 70s, they've gone beyond the sovereignty, territorial integrity aspects. They have now uh, borderless communities, right? Integration has happened with the Franco-German steel and coal uh, you know, agreements in the 1950s. So European Union also is not concerned about sovereignty and territorial integrity issues. Uh, the, uh, they have uh, a visa-free regime. Uh, they have customs free uh, across the board for the European countries. There are 29 odd countries. Uh, so US, EU, for example, or Canada, Mexico, uh, they're not overtly concerned about the sovereignty and territorial integrity issues. But in the case of China, but in the case of India, or states which have been recently formed, 1949, 1947, or others, they want to first have their borders secure, borders defined, borders, uh, you know, so your internal sovereignty, external sovereignty can be defined properly. So one of the things with China or even India, uh, the obsession is with protection of sovereignty, territorial integrity. Uh, these are part of the national interest. But as we will see in the Chinese case, it is defined in terms of the Communist Party's interest as well, in addition to the national interest. So you got to distinguish between national interest and the Communist Party's interest in the case of China. Uh, but if it is India, there is uh, everybody, every government official uh, need to be um, suggesting about constitutional obligations, constitutional uh, so Republic of India Constitution becomes the watchword for all of them. In the case of China, it is the Communist Party's uh, aspirations and ideology that is most important. A third determinant, which has come about uh, not so recently, but it, in recent times it has become more prominent, is on nationalism. Um, if you have read Chalmers Johnson's thesis, in the 1930s and 40s. He called this as peasant nationalism in China, where Mao Zedong mobilized the peasantry for the sake of revolution in 1949. Uh, subsequently, also, there is a certain nationalism that was generated. But uh, the, the targets of nationalism shifted. In the 1940s, 30s, and 40s, it was Japan, which is the focus of Chinese nationalism which remained constantly, that's because the Japanese defeated the Chinese in 1895, and a Treaty of Shimonoshiki led to Korean Peninsula, Taiwan, and other areas coming under Japan's rule. Uh, so in other words, after Vietnam, which attacked China uh, and the Middle Kingdom status, it is the Japanese who actually had punctured the Middle Kingdom status by the 1895 uh, war. So this suggests the nationalism in China is mostly directed against Japan. Uh, we have seen, for example, time and again, the Chinese mentioning about the Nanjing massacre, uh, about the comfort woman issue, the chemical and biological weapons used in northeast of China in Manchuria. Uh, or other um, Japanese, uh, you know, actions in coastal China during the 1930s and 40s. Um, this has been the theme all through, Chinese nationalism against the Japanese. Uh, it does influence foreign policy, uh, unless until these are very acute. Uh, for example, last 10, 15 years, there has been a lot of uh, Chinese protests on the Japanese uh, in relation to the Yasukuni shrine visits, or in relation to the historical issues, as they call. So Japan became a constant theme in Chinese nationalism. It does influence foreign policy. Although uh, next month, or, or rather this month, uh, March, uh, Xi Jinping is expected to go to Japan uh, and uh, kind of normalize the relations with Japan. Uh, but last uh, several years, there's been a frosty kind of relationship with the Japanese. So nationalism still is a factor. Uh, the 
targets of nationalism, Chinese nationalism also keep changing. Uh, while Japan is a constant theme, we also sometimes hear about uh, the Chinese protest against the Americans. Uh, for example, in 1998, when the Belgrade embassy of the Chinese was bombed by during the Cl Clinton government, there was a lot of protest on the American embassy in Beijing. Uh, they threw eggs, uh, tomatoes, and other things, uh, and then. There was the uh, there was the uh, apology that Bill Clinton made to the Chinese on the Belgrade embassy bombing. Um, so it does it did shift towards the United States as well, the nationalism factor. Um, but I would suggest um, for some of you to do research, some of you to do ponder over Chinese nationalism could also be directed against India for example, in certain cases. Uh, partly because the East India Company had the um, Indians recruited, mainly, mainly Sikh regiments. So sometimes this Chinese nationalism could also be directed. And we saw that, for example, during Doklam crisis in, 19, uh, in 2017, uh, there was a lot of uh, Chinese uh, three warfare that they waged, psychological warfare, legal warfare, media warfare. They, they consider these as kind of warfare. Uh, and uh, we saw during the 2017 incident, there was a lot of uh, publicity given uh, in terms of negative coverage towards India. So Chinese nationalism is not necessarily only for Japan, but it also influences. And when nationalism plus your foreign policy posture, they combine, it becomes quite uh, unmanageable for other countries to address these issues. So nationalism is one factor, which is not unique to China, uh, but uh, also to other countries. In India, for example, there is the nationalism, which sometimes is reflected on Pakistan or on other areas. Yes. Uh, could we hold the questions for right at the end? Let's uh, finish first. Uh, all right. uh, so, so, nationalism is one. Uh, um, please note down somewhere. We'll get back on to this. Um, the fourth determinant is uh, unlike in India, where the focus is mainly on Pakistan or on uh, South Asia in general. Uh, in the Chinese foreign policy, there is this concept of focus on the then superpowers. The focus is still there now in terms of the US. Um, all activities in terms of considering what the US or the Soviet Union, the then Soviet Union. So Chinese foreign policy has this element of uh, the superpowers as the centrality of their, their um, so Soviet Union was one before with which uh, they have followed what was mentioned as leaning to one side towards the Soviet Union in 1949. Um, and then uh, since the Nixon visit in 1972, there was the focus towards the US. So, um, so one of the determinants here is, what is China's equation with the superpowers? Today, this has become major powers rather than superpowers, because we only have one superpower, the US, which also is not able to really uh, determine the global events. For example, the 2003 Gulf War did not get the sanction from the United Nations Security Council, indicating the US also has some uh, weaknesses in terms of its hegemony, in terms of its leading position across the globe. So the Chinese today reformulate the fourth element in terms of one superpower, four major powers. Russia, EU, Japan, uh, and China uh, as part of that uh, equation. But what is important is that the focus on the superpowers, which has now become major powers, is still constant in China's foreign policy, uh, which makes the Chinese also the target of these countries. Um, finally, the other determinant is globalization. Um, two years ago, uh, or rather in January 2017, 
Uh, Xi Jinping, the president, went to Davos meeting and said, China will be the leading force behind globalization. Uh, and this is quite strange because uh, generally communists across the globe, they have issues on globalization. That somebody else is controlling the multinational co corporations are controlling the flow of goods and services, technology, uh, commerce, uh, and uh, you know investments, um, the multinational corporations. But today, since 2000, late 2000, joining of the WTO, World Trade Organization, China actually today has become one of the major beneficiaries of globalization. Uh, in 2000, they had just about $200 billion trade. Uh, exports and imports. Today, that constitutes nearly $4 trillion. So, in other words, they actually benefited from globalization. Uh, this $4 trillion constitutes nearly about 40% of their GDP, uh, exports and imports. So, it is bringing a lot of money to the country, right? Uh, at one time, during just before the global financial crisis in 2008, China used to earn about $300 billion a month by exports. So that's a huge component in terms of benefits of globalization. In addition to the other things like S&P, uh, science and technology, um, tourism. Um, for instance, China receives a lot of tourists from abroad. Uh, China is today also is uh, uh, sending across a lot of people. Uh, last year, they have 180 million tourists going abroad, although just about 2 lakh, 200,000 of Chinese came to India. But the figures globally are 180 million people going abroad. For countries like Thailand, uh, Maldives, uh, where they are heavily based on tourism, this is actually a major uh, contribution in terms of the earnings uh, from the tourism industry. Uh, so globalization is beneficial to China, uh, and hence they, they want the globalization to be continued. Uh, today, as part of globalization, China has over 36,000 companies uh, working abroad. Uh, these companies are mainly state-owned enterprises, so like Indian public sector units controlled by the, um, by the by the party, by the uh, the state-owned enterprises also, for example, have 100 seats in the National Party Congress, uh, which means they also determine who will be the next general secretary of the party, uh, and also the other functionaries in the Foreign Bureau. Uh, unlike uh, the uh, PSUs in India, who don't determine who will be the prime minister, who will be the uh, cabinet ministers in India, the state-owned enterprises have nearly 100 seats out of nearly 2,500 seats in the National Party Congresses. So they also influence in large way. But most important, if your company is working abroad, you need to protect these companies, right? You need to do a lot of other diplomatic work. For example, Germany, UK are under tremendous pressure, even India, is under tremendous pressure to include Huawei 5G in their telecom industry. For example, Trump called up Boris Johnson and said, don't include 5G in your networks. Yet Boris Johnson snubbed Trump, uh, even though they were allies, NATO partners. Uh, UK is going ahead with the 5G Huawei. Uh, of course, everyone says that Huawei 5G uh, is the one of the cheapest. Uh, most important, they say this is a private company in China uh, and uh, uh, that it doesn't have much state subsidy. But James Mulvenon uh, said Huawei 5G was subsidized by the state almost roughly by $75 billion uh, uh, in terms of its uh, marketing, in terms of its production line. Um, and uh, under WTO, there is no p possibility of any state subsidizing these companies. Most important, also, Huawei is known to be close to the Chinese military. Uh, and hence, there is also this hand of party military 
behind this Huawei 5G. Uh, whatever it is, these diplomacies also backed up a Chinese company. And this is not unusual, even in the US, for example, Microsoft or other companies would be backed up by the state by its preferential policies, by the direction that they take. So it's not so unique to China uh, that these companies are backed up by the state in one way or the other. Um, uh, for example, the, you may have heard about Adani's and Reliance companies. Although these are private, still you see that the, uh, the, the kind of uh, support they get from the Indian state. When Prime Minister Modi went to uh, Lahore for that Christmas Eve um, to attend Nawaz Sharif's granddaughter's wedding, there was also the Adani's who were present in that, right? So you do see the uh, states do sometimes support the industries, the, even if these are private ones. Uh, so the second aspect, other than tourism, you have these uh, companies working outside uh, China, for which the, the diplomacy needs to service their demand uh, in one way or the other, like, like in the Huawei 5G that I just explained. A third component is that there are a lot of other um, uh, investments abroad. Uh, according to the American Enterprise Institute, uh, and I would recommend you to look at Derek Caesar's uh, compilation of statistics on Chinese investment abroad. Uh, they argue that China has something like $2 trillion of investment abroad. Sometimes the AEI exaggerate the Chinese investment. For example, they say China had invested $56 billion in India, while the actual investment was $8.2 billion in India. So it is a huge uh, variation, but nevertheless, um, uh, you could see the third element that is Chinese investment abroad is increasing, partly because of this globalization. And today, the traditional diplomacies, which is state to state, which is between foreign ministers, etc., now changes in terms of this globalization. There are other larger forces that are emerging as part of globalization. So that also becomes a kind of determinant in the Chinese foreign policy. Um, let me get back to the Communist Party. Uh, the most decisive element in China's foreign policy is the Communist Party. And the Communist Party has the uh, Central Committee Foreign Affairs Bureau. Um, and a second major decision maker is the small leading group. Central leadership, small leading group. Something like our uh, empowered group of ministers in India. Uh, of course, Prime Minister Modi has canceled all the uh, GOMs and EGOMs. Uh, Mr. Pranam Mukherjee used to head those, uh, those uh, group of ministers and empowered group of ministers. But that is the most powerful uh, decision maker. Um, uh, still, it is one of the most uh, decisive. I will explain this in the next slide. Uh, just suffice it to uh, know at the moment that this is the, one of the major decisive bodies in China that decides about all aspects, including on foreign policy. Um, the second, obviously, the one which has to carry forward diplomacy is the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And uh, it was headed by uh, people who were number two or number three before. Uh, Chow Lai was number three, uh, and he was also the premier of the State Council, the prime minister, uh, till the 19, early 1960s. So from 49 till roughly 1961, he uh, was a major leader and uh, in terms of the foreign policy posture as well. Then you have other leaders. Uh, one of the things in early Chinese foreign policy is many of them were military officers. Uh, Chow Enlai was a military officer. He was a deputy to Chiang Kai-shek in the Huangpu Academy uh, and a professional military soldier, military officer. Uh, who became foreign minister. Uh, then Chen Yi, one of the 10 marshals in the PLA, People's Liberation Army, 
Uh, Shani as well became the foreign minister of China. Um, the militaries are supposed to uh, protect national interests and wage wars with the external adversary, right? The foreign ministry is supposed to do the diplomacy. But you have here the, the minister himself from the, from the defense field, from military field. So it's like a strange combination uh, that we saw in China. And we do not know how far this has led to conflict with other countries. But the fact of the matter is China did conflict with the neighbors. Uh, you had the Korean War, 1950-51. You had the India-China conflict, 1962, during Chinese regime. Chinese, um, uh, you know, when he was the foreign minister. Uh, then you have the uh, Sino-Soviet conflict in 1969. Then you have the uh, Vietnam War in 1979. So China had, uh, in the 50s and 60s, substantial conflicts with the neighbors uh, in terms of the military posturing and other. Huang Hua uh, served in the UN uh, or UN bodies uh, after China became uh, the member of the UN in 1971. Uh, Tian Qishan, another, uh, his main duty was how China should be integrated into the global system after the Tiananmen Square incident in 1989 because after 1989, many countries have imposed trade embargoes on China, citing the killing of students and peasant workers in the Tiananmen Square incident. Uh, Tan Chia Xuan was the successor to Chiang Qishan. Li Chaoqing, Yang Tse Tzu, who becomes a Politburo member, and currently Wang Yi uh, are the foreign ministers. Obviously, they have huge focus in terms of the foreign ministry's work. Uh, and sometimes there are special representatives from the president to tackle various issues. Um, if China has joined the globalization, benefited globalization, much of the work is to be done by the commerce ministry, right? Commerce ministry need to do the export import, uh, also look at the investments abroad, uh, and also mergers and acquisitions, which becomes a major item in their uh, focus areas. So MOFCOM, Ministry of Commerce, and the Chambers of Commerce, the Shanghai Chambers of Commerce. Shanghai today has a vibrant stock exchange uh, in which there are about 150 million investors, pretty young. Most of these investors are of your age, 25 to 30 years age. Uh, and of course, many of them suffered because of the the global financial crisis. Uh, many of them suffer are suffering because of the current coronavirus, novel coronavirus uh, related issues. Um, Chambers of Commerce and the commercial lobby has now been one of the major uh, determinant in the Chinese foreign policy because they're bringing in a lot of money to the state, right? Uh, as I mentioned before, in terms of the exports, imports or uh, investments abroad. Finally, you have also the Ministry of National Defense. Although it has very less role, there is the Central Military Commission and the China's military. Uh, you may wonder how China's military is a major determinant in foreign policy. Foreign policy is supposed to be done by foreign policy bureaucrats, right? Uh, but in the case of China, it is kind of organic. Uh, in the case of China, as we will see in the next slide, the small leading groups also have the military component in terms of their presence in the decision-making body. Uh, the PLA is one of the most patriotic organizations, institutions in China, like all military uh, everywhere, right? They are the most patriotic, na highly nationalist. The PLA has its own agenda in terms of their foreign policy posture. Uh, number one. Number two, most of the PLA also controls the far-flung areas in China, China's neighborhood. Um, if you look at the Chinese map, most of these areas are actually controlled by the PLA uh, in Xinjiang, in Tibet, in other areas, uh, in Mongolia, other areas. So neighborhood policy gets a lot of military, um, uh, you know, influence in China. So this has now become as well a kind of determinant. 
Uh, PLA also demands from the foreign ministry what kind of foreign policy posture ought to be made. For example, of course, many of these times they, their, their position is uh, overruled. Uh, for example, the PLA demanded from Japan $180 billion in compensation for what they did in 1930s. Like Shashi Tharoor asked the British to pay one rupee uh, a year for what, what has been done during the 19th-20th century. Hmm? But the PLA demand $180 billion. This has been overruled by the, by the foreign ministry because once such claims uh, begin, you never know also who will start demanding what. Uh, for example, the Chinese people will probably start demanding some compensation for the Tiananmen Square incident. The Tibetans would start demanding something as well, right? For what has been done in the last, say, seven decades. So these issues become also the focus internally. Uh, but what is important is the PLA start also started to uh, influence the decision making in terms of their demands. Uh, and in general, uh, as we see, for example, in White House, the Pentagon's influence is quite, quite dominant. Of course, the State Department's influence is the decisive. There is also the, uh, when we look at Iraq, when we look at Afghanistan, when we look at Kosovo, when we look at all the other issues, the Pentagon's influence is quite sharp. Uh, likewise, in China, the PLA influence in the foreign policy making is as well a major determining factor. I was mentioning about the small leading group, and there are seven small leading groups currently in China. Uh, each of these look at one specific subject, uh, and each Politburo Standing Committee member, these are the most powerful people in China, the seven Politburo Standing Committee members. Each of them head, or most of the time, the General Secretary of the party head these small leading groups. Um, as I was mentioning, it is something like, like Indian's uh, empowered group of ministry, ministers. So it's quite compact, more decisive uh, that we saw in the case of India. Uh, but that is what is present. So first is the foreign affairs small leading group, obviously headed by Xi Jinping now. There is the vice premier state councillor, uh, that is Yang Che Shu, who, is, who was the foreign minister before who is also part of this. And then, uh, carefully look at the third bullet point here in the first item. International Liaison Department of the Communist Party, uh, which has a say in the foreign policy making. Secondly, the Minister for National Defense is a member of the small leading group. Then, of course, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, the minister, the currently Wang Yi, you have also the Ministry of Commerce representative, or even the minister himself, and culture. Uh, culture ministry uh, representative is also here in this small leading group, the apex body. Um, then the other, you may wonder why the uh, publicity department, the newspaper agencies are also the most decisive. Xinhua news agency sometimes acts as the, the embassies in many countries. In Hong Kong, when it was in the British uh, control till 1997, Xinhua News Agency used to be the main uh, actor for China, and it used to issue visas for anyone who wants to visit China. So Xinhua News Agency, unlike the PTI, Press Trust of India, uh, is very powerful. Uh, it acts as like the state, state representative. And it's also part of the small leading group. Um, so there are other six small leading groups. Let us not spend much time on this. They do have some role in the foreign policy domain. Uh, for example, in energy, on Taiwan, overseas propaganda, state security, uh, finance and economics. There are various influences on the external policy as well. So one is a decision maker. Second is, decision maker is the one who takes the decision. 
whether to follow A, B, C, D policies. Uh, and then you have policy making institutions, which provide for A, B, C, D options to the decision makers to decide whether to uh, carry forward with these, uh, these choices. Uh, so China, like in every other country, policy making institutions provide the policy options uh, for the decision makers. And finally, these are uh, chosen by the decision makers and adopted. Uh, here as well, you see many of the think tanks uh, that China has are dominated by the party uh, organizations. Uh, by the way, the thumb rule is if you want to get a promotion, if you want to be, if you want to be transferred from one unit to the other, if you, if you need any favor, you need to be a party member in China. So 90 million carders in China uh, do have something or the other, and they float in many of the external decision-making bodies. Uh, so here, in think tanks, uh, some think tanks like Kikir. Kikir is one of the leading think tanks in China. 450 researchers uh, in this think tank. Um, uh, it is directly under the Central Committee Foreign Affairs Bureau and also under the Public Security Ministry, that is like the Home Ministry in India. Um, so Kikir, for instance, 90% of their output, research output is for the government. So what you see, 10% in the public domain, is all vetted, is all uh, carefully, you know, it's for public consumption, not for the party-shaped uh, decision makers. So you can imagine the kind of uh, classified work these think tanks do for China, or for the Chinese government. So here you have CIIS, China Institute for International Studies. Um, uh, this is another major think tank for the foreign ministry. Its influence is so uh, high, many of these members become ambassadors from China. The former ambassador in New Delhi, uh, Mr. Weiwei, was a researcher in CIIS. Um, it has a library which has some four floors down the underground in Beijing. And they have so much of, uh, and their journal, um, International Studies is one of the standard journals, which suggests that uh, if you want to know about the uh, policies related to China external dimension, CIIS journal is one of the best. Uh, as well as Kikir or other think tanks. Uh, so one at the party level, then there is at the professional level, think tanks, are also, although they are also part of the party membership. Uh, some of the think tanks in China also issue PhDs, unlike in India, uh, where mainly universities provide the PhDs. Uh, in the case of China, the think tanks also grant PhDs. Uh, so this is quite unique. Um, and then they have colleges and universities. But I, what I wanted to highlight here is Jindal Global, Global University, when it has a PhD program, it allows the students to choose their topics. It allows your individual uh, choices. It respects your individual choices, right? You choose your own topic and you come forward with a professional. In China, all thesis have to be policy oriented. To what extent is this beneficial to the state? Hmm? That is the key for any PhD thesis. Not that they are doing some glorified policy research, but structurally, all PhD theses ought to be policy oriented. This is one that distinguishes the Chinese think tank with, say, an Indian think tank or an Indian university. Uh, so this is one uh, linkage between research and policy making. Policy making is seen as part of the strategy and tactics in international relations. So this is quite unique. Um, nobody in JG, JGU will tell you to do on policy. If you want to do, you're, you're welcome. But but there is no force on you uh, or across the globe in the universities. 
Uh, so this is one major difference between. So you have the decision makers, you have the policy makers uh, providing the uh, options for the decision makers uh, in terms of the foreign policy. Then you have the party itself, its ideology, its aspirations, which becomes quite crucial in terms of their foreign policy posture. Uh, and 18 party Congress in 2012 had set up a few things. One, they said, we want core interests to be protected. So Xi Jinping at that time, who became the general secretary uh, since 2012, he said, core interests will not be sacrificed by, for developmental interests. Core interests will not be sacrificed for developmental interests. Developmental interests include, say, economy, uh, uh, you have other, say, uh, infrastructure building uh, or other aspects. But core interests, we'll, we'll see what these core interests are later on. Um, and the Party Congress also suggested to celebrate the two centennial, two hundreds. That is the hundredth year of the Communist Party of China in 2021 and the hundredth anniversary of the PRC in 2049. So they have a certain uh, roadmap. Uh, I'm not sure whether any one of you have plans for 2049. Do any one of you have plans for 2049? Uh, I may not last long till 2049, but you will all last long till 2049. Um, China has proposed a 2021, 2035, 2049 plan. Hmm? So they have a strategic vision. Uh, uh, in terms of where their nation goes. Uh, so this is one, uh, by 2021, that is next year, they want to establish a well-off society. We don't know exactly what is a well-off society, but sometimes the Chinese suggest the socioeconomic level in terms of per capita, health, life expectancy, so on, at the level of the European Union, European country. So that's about $25,000 to about $35,000 uh, per capita income. Currently, they have about $10,000 per capita income. Uh, but of course, last two months, there has been a huge setback because of the coronavirus. Uh, China has come to a standstill. The whole country has now been almost quarantined. Production lines are not moving. Uh, and there is a huge problem with this well-off society. We do not know whether they will be able to reach this well of society concept, uh, but this is one that has come about. In 2013, the focus became on major powers, uh, and major powers defined in comprehensive national power, uh, and GDP, military, uh, energy consumption, foreign policy power, that is how you are able to influence. Um, uh, I just wanted to give you a statistic uh, that nearly 100 to 150 heads of states, prime ministers, presidents, or whoever visit Beijing every year. So that's a quite foreign policy attraction, right? Uh, in terms of where China is heading. Um, they also mention about good neighborliness policy. They mention about the, in the SICA, uh, Conference on Initiatives in Confidence Building Measures in Asia. In the SICA Summit meeting in Shanghai in 2014, Xi Jinping suggested that the uh, Asian countries should look after their own security, which basically means US should get out of Asia. That's uh, in more impolite manner. Uh, that is what the message has been. Uh, so these are part of the 18 party Congress. 19th Party Congress in 2017 had these items. Uh, in terms of time, let me shorten this. Uh, they have various uh, roadmaps, uh, as I mentioned to you, 2049, 2050, um, and various others. Um, one of the things here is the six no's policy mentioned by 
Xi Jinping in the bullet point on Taiwan, six notes. Anyone, any organization, any political party at any time or in any form to separate any part of Chinese territory from China. Now, this is potentially applicable to Taiwan, Hong Kong, Macau, Tibet, Xinjiang, Inner Mongolia, or other areas. So this is directed against those, uh, those policies. But supposing if these are all extended, if these are all uh, in gray zones, for example, Senkaku Islands is administered by the Japanese. Hmm? They all will fall into this Chinese perception that this is a Chinese part. Uh, secondly, Arunachal Pradesh has been included in, in southern Tibet since 2004-05 period. So today, Arunachal Pradesh is part of their, their perception about Tibet. So in other words, again, if uh, Rajnath Singh had visited Arunachal Pradesh two weeks ago, then the Chinese are up in arms uh, on the visit as such. Although India says that this is its internal uh, region, so on and so forth, yet this becomes a problematic area in terms of the foreign policy uh, interactions. Okay. We saw that their focus is mainly on superpowers before. Now, one superpower has gone, Soviet Union is gone. US is also not able to really influence global events. Uh, as we saw during the second Iraq war, um, in terms of the Security Council blessings on the use of force. So they formulated the five pillar strategy. The five pillar strategy includes first focus on major powers, US, European Union, Russia, and sometimes they include Japan in this major power. Uh, hardly India's role here as a major power because they consider India as part of South Asia. Uh, even though India's GDP has grown substantially, yet they consider India still as part of the South Asian region. The second is focusing on neighbors. Third, in terms of developing countries. Fourth, in terms of multilateralism, multilateral institutions. Uh, and fifth, in terms of soft power expansion soft power uh, influence across the globe. So these five pillar strategy today is the focus of foreign policy in China. Um, we can analyze the foreign policy posture here in these. Um, and then there were five party related foreign affairs conferences. These are again, um, so what happens in these is Xi Jinping calls all the Chinese ambassadors, 190 odd ambassadors from all across, and then he mentions what are the priorities that China has. Uh, the most elaborate one was the fourth foreign affairs uh, conference. In this conference, he mentioned about various things, but, but of interest to us is um, uh, reform of international institutions like IMF, World Bank, in terms of their voting rights. Uh, then protecting China's overseas interests. I mentioned to you before the $2 trillion investment, 36,000 Chinese companies working abroad, or 180 million Chinese going abroad. Now, today the Chinese embassy in New Delhi or other places, their main duty now becomes the focus on these three issues, like, like the one that he's mentioned in the protecting China's overseas interests. So this is a new mission in diplomacy that is um, um, the recent fifth meeting as well in June 2019 also reiterates the same position. Okay. Last four decades, there is a certain philosophy that has been driving China. Uh, it's mentioned as keeping a low profile. Deng Xiaoping in 1989 proposed a concept called 
keeping a low profile. So what China did with this was it escaped the wrath of the US. The Soviet Union could not escape this wrath and it was disintegrated in 1991. Hmm? China tried to escape this superpower competition of becoming another target of the US by this policy of keeping a low profile. And it is reflected in five areas. Chinese foreign policy since then mentioned that China will avoid forming big factions. For instance, in, in global affairs, you have, say, climate change related factions. You have globalization factions. You have uh, uh, alliance factions, you know, in alliances in different places, or various other factions like this. So China refused to be part of any of these. Previously, China was part of the third world uh, concept. Uh, for example, Afro-Asian unity, Afro-Asian countries. Today, China says it is not part of any one of these. Last three to four decades, since 1980s, China refused to be part of any one of these. So it followed a pragmatic foreign policy. And that resulted in a lot of benefits to the Chinese state. Hmm? Second, it said it will not lead any opinion in the international system. Uh, and hence, again, kept it far away. For example, on North Korea, um, except for protecting North Korea as such, they didn't mention anything about the WMD proliferation. They didn't mention anything about the North Korean related controversy. Um, so that resulted in China itself following a kind of pragmatic policy. Uh, a third, avoiding trouble in international. So they refused to join any conflict. For instance, Afghanistan, for instance, Iraq, for instance, like the, like the Russians today joined the Syrians in the fight against the uh, Assad uh, relation. China refuses to be part of that. Uh, kind of controversy. So as a result, China was able to preserve its strength hmm, and did not spend much uh, in terms of its energy on all these events. So this is one which is important. The fourth point is they focused on economic development, uh, economics as the focus. So that has led to China becoming the second largest economy in the world uh, with roughly $14 trillion last year. Uh, and then finally, in terms of improving relations with all countries, during Mao Zedong's time, they had very few countries supporting them because they followed, they criticized the US as imperialist, they criticized the Soviets as social imperialist, they criticized Nehru as a running dog of imperialism. In 1961, there was an article in, in Peking Review in which uh, the title was The Philosophy of Mr. Nehru. And he, they said Nehru was a running dog of imperialism. So that was the kind of foreign policy post that they had before. Now, they do not raise much like this, except, say, Doklam kind of incident or when China-Japan conflict goes up. So we can broadly say that this was the policy till about 19 party congress. Now, since 19 party congress in 2017, Xi Jinping started emphasizing on the word accomplish something. This is again a loaded term. And one of the things in the Chinese language or Chinese philosophy is there are so many subtle uh, concepts we cannot translate them uh, effectively, and we do not know what exactly that meaning is, because it is all culturally constructed meaning. Uh, so he mentioned that instead of keeping a low profile, as this slide suggests, Xi Jinping started advocating accomplish something. 
We do not know what exactly is this, but what we have seen is active opposition to the US or other NATO allies, uh, or China began showing its, uh, its interest in many regions in the world. Uh, we have seen that China today wants to protect its interest abroad. So this is which is ticking China on other countries. So we saw Hong Kong burning for, for the past since March last year. Uh, we saw Taiwan uh, issue becoming quite controversial. We saw even Arunachal Pradesh or Xinjiang where the U.S. has passed the Uyghur Bill uh, and the Asia Reassurance Initiative Act uh, last January. All this suggests accomplished something is resulting in a uh, lot of controversy and pitching China against the U.S. So is that bipolarity that we, are see that we saw during the Cold War? I doubt because U.S. is investing a lot in China. Hmm? Uh, and China has a very pragmatic policy. So to that extent, this is not the classical Cold War that we saw between Soviet Union and China uh, and the US. But we are seeing during the Trump administration, we are seeing active, um, uh, you know, uh, contestation between the two sides, China and the US. So this is one in the last few years we have seen um, I was mentioning about national interest before. Um, um, like any country, national interest would be about sovereignty, territorial integrity, the uh, long-term interest of the country. Um, Dai Pinko, who served as state councillor, which is above the foreign minister in ranking, uh, we don't have such kind of a uh, such kind of a minister, but. Um, but in the case of China, the state councillor is higher than the foreign minister. Uh, so Dai Pinko said, China's core interests include maintenance of the fundamental system. Fundamental system meaning Communist Party dominated system. That's, that is number one core interest. Um, number two is protection of sovereignty and territorial integrity. Uh, third is stable development of economy and society. Uh, he mentioned this as part of the U.S.-China discussion. Uh, that became the famous core interest of China. Uh, and then there are national interests, which uh, Yan Shui-Tung, a leading IR specialist in Tsinghua University, argued. And these are some of those national interests. But what is important to summarize this slide, fundamental system of China includes the Communist Party domination. Uh, of all uh, aspects, including on foreign policy. The second is sovereignty, territorial integrity. So China resolved territorial disputes with uh, 12 of its 14 land neighbors with none of the five maritime neighbors. So maritime issues have now become quite acute on South China Sea, Shantoko Island. Uh, Indian Ocean Pacific also becoming the focus since 2009. Um, only India and Bhutan have not resolved the territorial disputes with China. And it does have some pillar effect in terms of stability with India, stability with Bhutan uh, on the land border. Um, and this is my final slide. Uh, diplomacy can also be reflected in multilateral diplomacy by participating in multilateral institutions. Um, uh, China has floated or has supported many of these institutions like the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, uh, like the East Asian Summit. But increasingly, China is pushing through China-centric multilateral institutions like the EU 18 plus 1. Central and East European countries they are increasingly engaging with China as part of the Belt and Road Initiative or as part of the overall infrastructure development projects. So Germany, France, UK are unhappy because China is today pushing through a EU 18 plus 1, which is, they think, is divisive 
in the Euro film. Of course, the UK had the Brexit recently. They themselves have moved out of the, Brexit, of the uh, EU. Uh, that's a different matter. But what is important is a country from, uh, from Asia is having a... Then there is also CELAC, Central American, Latin American uh, grouping, CELAC in which China is now pushing CELAC plus three uh, concept. Like they wanted to push through China plus SARC, South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, which India objected, which India stalled this process of China becoming a member in the SARC process. Uh, uh, China plus African Union um, in, the, in the POCAC, Forum for Cooperation on China-Africa, uh, in this format, they have now nearly 40 countries in Africa joining um, in various six of these summit meetings. So multilateral diplomacy is one which China is more confident. Previously, it was bilateral, but today they feel more confident in bilateral diplomacy. Then there is the good neighborliness policy or peripheral diplomacy. Um, China has these many neighbors, 14 land neighbors, five maritime neighbors. Uh, quite huge. After Russia, they are the ones who have the largest number of neighbors. Uh, so there is the good neighborliness policy, first initiated in 1954, revived in 2001, intensified in the recent times again uh, as part of the SICA summit meetings. A third component is commercial diplomacy. The foreign ministry today is expanding in terms of um, uh, commercial diplomacy. Uh, so you have specialized people coming from, from uh, on tariffs, on legal issues related to investment, investment protection, uh, uh, or on other complicated issues in WTO mechanism. Uh, so commercial diplomacy today also looks at mergers and acquisitions in terms of patents, in terms of intellectual property rights, uh, and other aspects. So this is a, a more professional segment within the foreign ministry, which is now becoming pretty strong, uh, emerging. Then there is energy diplomacy. The Chinese state, party state, also benefits the energy lobbies in, in the country. Um, there are several big energy companies in China, uh, CNPC, China National Petroleum Corporation. Its uh, turnover is about $1.2 trillion. That's roughly half of the Indian GDP. One Chinese company has so much of uh, turnover. You can imagine the kind of power the CNPC has. Uh, likewise, Chinook, China Natural Offshore Oil Company, or other companies, they've become too big. Uh, and the Chinese state also promotes their, uh, their uh, functioning abroad. They have something like 50 agreements with uh, various countries, Venezuela, um, uh, Nigeria, Kazakhstan, Sudan, or other countries. So energy diplomacy is important today as well for China because of the uh, second largest consumer uh, that China has become and they are importing a lot of energy. And this is also related to the environmental diplomacy because today they are importing more gas rather than oil, which is more polluting, uh, or coal, coal-based thermal power plants. So environmental diplomacy, again, is another area where, uh, in terms of participation in the Copenhagen or in the Paris 2015 meeting, uh, and how to cut down the emissions. What are the things that China should do to protect itself from the, from the other country's demands on emissions? Because China also says that it is putting up manufacturing sector so that there is sustainable development uh, in terms of jobs, in terms of other economics. So environmental diplomacy is again a specialized uh, division within the foreign ministry. Finally, there is the public diplomacy section. 
In 1986, the Chinese has established the, uh, the external publicity division, uh, the spokesperson uh, institution, so that they communicate to the world on what the Chinese leaders think or what China's foreign policy stands for. Um, this has been a very growing uh, sector in terms of transparency, in terms of uh, various other new developments that are happening in China's diplomacy. So public diplomacy um, is supposed to enhance China's positive image across the globe. Um, in many areas, of course, it takes a beating. Whenever you have virus spread, whenever you have uh, Hong Kong related developments or other related developments, yet this is a major component in China's diplomacy in the recent times. Let me stop here and collect these questions. Um, this is in relation to the uh, strategies they could adopt, but I will skip this slide. Uh, I'll give you the next question. Uh, so the official communist party line or the communist ideology plays a huge role in Chinese foreign policy. Then why do we not see uh, natural, they, they, we should have seen a natural bond between Russia and China. But we do not see any such uh, discourse happening anywhere in any of the international peace. Uh, good question. <clears throat> when the Soviet Union disintegrated, the one of the lessons that the Chinese um, implemented was to avoid the Soviet kind of uh, foreign policy posturing. Soviet Union actively countered the US and it paid. So Tang Xiaoping's policy was let us avoid the Soviet focus on the US as the target uh, and focusing on economy as we just discussed. So as a result, the number one, the CPSU disintegrated and then the Soviet Union disintegrated in 91. Communist Party of the Soviet Union disintegration means China now has to deal with who was the power in Moscow. Uh, not necessarily a Communist Party leader. Boris Yeltsin was not a Communist Party leader. Putin is not a Communist Party leader. But you have to deal with this. And this is also part of the fifth element that we covered before. You got to do business with all. Hmm? So number one. Number two, in June 2001, China and Russia signed an agreement. Article 9 of this agreement suggests both will protect each other. Hmm? It was not very explicit in its uh, statement, but it implies that if Russia is attacked, China will support, or if China is attacked, Russia will support <coughs> China. Um, it is loosely worded. So it cannot be perfectly mentioned. The third point on this is Russia and China today are pretty close, uh, except on coronavirus. Because Russia and North Korea are the first states to shut down the borders with China. And they started doing the uh, facial recognition of Chinese in Moscow and other cities. Um, you can say that. Russia is not close to China or Russia fears China because of this coronavirus issue. But I think to be, uh, to be plain, I think they were looking for the health of the Russian citizens. So it is, they need to protect the Russians, so they have uh, implemented this quarantine on the Chinese visitors to Russia. But most important, Russia and China are pretty close today in the BRI, Belt and Road Initiative. Russia and China are closing multipolarity debate in the United Nations Security Council. China had roughly 11 uh, veto exercises in the Security Council so far. All of these, or major portion of these, were in conjunction with 
either the Soviet Union or Russia in the last, say, four decades. So they coordinate their positions in the Security Council. If you look at the pattern of these uh, vetoes, Russia and China coordinated in the Security Council. On North Korea, on Iran, on Syria, on Myanmar, on various other, um, uh, on, uh, on uh, Zimbabwe, on uh, you know, Venezuela, um, they have coordinated the position. Russia and China also have coordinated in SEO, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So much so, two years ago, Russia merged the EEU, Eurasian Economic Union, with that of the Belt and Road Initiative. Quite big uh, concession from Russia. But here you see um, there is an ancient Chinese strategy called Funk Away Too which basically means reversing the role of a guest by the host uh, or vice versa, which basically means in Central Asia, in Eurasia, Russia used to be a very strong uh, power. Tsarist Russia, Soviet Russia, Russian Federation. Uh, in fact, in many countries, you see at least 10 to 15 percent of the population Russian. Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, or uh, Ukraine. These are Russian origin, mainly. Uh, significant proportion of the... So today, the Russians are concerned with this uh, ancient strategy that China could play, reversing the role of a host and a ghost, uh, and a guest, uh, which means basically, China is entering into Eurasia, sometimes at the cost of Russia. So they are concerned about this role play. And this is one reason Russians don't allow the Chinese to come closer in the security field. Economic field is fine. Energy pipelines are fine. Trade and investments are fine, but not in the security field, which is the core of any country. So to answer your question, Russia, China do have differences but they are pretty close on this multipolarity and because both of them see U.S. as a challenger. And the U.S. itself in the NSS national security strategy that the Trump administration released, they identified Russia and China as competitors, right? So it's both ways. Mirror imaging happens between Russia, China on one hand, U.S. on the other. Okay. When you mentioned that China, uh, Chinese nationalism is, nationalism is directed towards Japan, US, and India, but uh, I guess Taiwan is also directed towards Taiwan in the sense that uh, they believe Taiwan to be a part of their own country. And uh, yeah, uh, well, a significant or overwhelming population of Taiwanese, 27 million Taiwanese, are Han Chinese. So Chinese nationalism is based on Han Chinese nationalism. Uh, it's like Hindu nationalism in India. Hmm? Uh, so Han Chinese nationalism, because the Taiwanese are also Han, a majority of them are Han, excepting four to five percent indigenous people. Hmm? Uh, Taiwan is also hugely homogeneous, like Korea, like Japan, homogeneous population. There are hardly any minorities, hmm? uh, except these indigenous people in Taiwan. So Chinese calculus is Taiwanese are Chinese, although Taiwanese say they are not Chinese, they are Taiwanese. Hmm? Uh, so this is the problem in, in terms of Chinese nationalism directed against Taiwan. Hmm? they identify Taiwanese as Chinese, and hence the nationalism is not directed on Taiwan. If it is purely military preparation, that's a different aspect. We are talking about nationalism. So because the Chinese nationalism is Han nationalism, and since Taiwanese are predominantly Han Chinese, they migrated to Taiwan since uh, 16th century. Uh, and then in 1949, 
Chinese-Chinese-Chinese-Chinese-Chinese-Chinese-Chinese-Chinese-Chinese-Chinese-Chinese-Chinese-Chinese-Chinese-Chinese-Chinese-Chinese-Chinese-Chinese-Chinese-
from nearly 10% on an average to about 6.1% uh, official estimates for 2019. And if this year's figures are going to go down, this will increase unemployment. According to a study by the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, for every 1% decline in growth rate, there are 8 million jobless. Hmm? So we're going to see huge social unrest in China unless they uh, ramp up production. Hmm? So it has a social connection in terms of the uh, problems at the society level. Political level, you may have seen that the National People's Congress, the parliament session, and the CPPCC, a consultative organization, their meetings have been postponed. We do not know when they will be held. Some 3,000 parliamentarians have to go to Beijing hmm, to pass the law. But that has been postponed now, which means many of the legal aspects will have to be postponed. Secondly, budgetary allocation will also have to be postponed. You know that in India, if the parliament doesn't meet next week, the budgetary session will have to be postponed. If budgetary session postponed, many government employees' salaries will be problematic. So this is another problem in terms of the politics. But also in 2022, the 20th Party Congress is due. And the preparation for this will start this year, end of this year. But if the whole country is locked down, many cities are locked down, then we can't have political activity as well. So this is going to have a huge impact on the politics of China because party congress is important, which brings in the new leadership. Hmm? Uh, strangely, in all this, Xi Jinping appeared only once in public domain. Of course, he headed the three Politburo standing committee meetings so far in the last one month, but there was a huge problem on that. So it's going to have an impact on the politics. The final one in terms of impact on the globe. Now China is at the center of all the supply chains across the globe. Uh, India, US, Japan, South Korea, ASEAN, European Union, Africa. Um, if Africa wants to export timber uh, or energy, there's nobody to receive you in Quanto. Hmm? So there is a disruption in supply chain. It's going to have a huge impact even on Indian economy. So one is, uh, forget about safety, forget about the uh, spread of virus, which is actually taking a lot of toll. Iran, uh, which is surprising, uh, South Korea, some six to 700 people contracted. Um, so it is spreading and various estimates suggested actually there will be a global epidemic. Hmm? Uh, this may not kill people, but this will disrupt the life, economy, um, and whatever. So, so that is the impact across the globe. Uh, life, economy, uh, disruption, general disruption. Hmm? If uh, the virus spreads to uh, India, for example, we cannot have this interaction. We'll have to do it by Skype. Hmm? Uh, across China, all schools and colleges are being shut. Hmm? Uh, in Italy, they have been shutting down the schools in North Italy have been shutting down schools and institutions. Hmm? Uh, so that is the prospect. Uh, let's hope it doesn't spread that wide, which means it disrupts everything else. Economic activity, educational, uh, you know, career. Yeah. Um, so I have three questions kind of tied together. One, why is China so obsessed with its uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity considering its size, the scale of its military and its economic power. Second, um, Xi Jinping has basically flipped Deng Xiaoping thought on its head, right? The uh, lie low policy. 
So now they're aggressive, they're confronting US everywhere, they're uh, economically expanding, they're doing everything to push their soft power across all multilateral institutions. So what is the long-term impact of this new stance on China's prospects, on China's rise in general? Because it went from being a maybe nebulous threat to an active threat, like at least in the Indian context, to a certain degree in the American context. I think you mentioned the national security report. They mentioned, uh, I think China's risen to number two or number one threat for America, as opposed to Russia. And the third thing is, how equipped is India in dealing with this foreign policy posture and its implications, right? So if um, recently there were this news that China has been reshaping global maps to show Arunachal Pradesh and the Nine Dash Nine as part of Chinese territory in global maps, right? Uh, because it's manufacturing those maps and it refuses to let any map that is not sanctioned by the CCP to be uh, manufactured and sold. So if you could shed light on this. Yeah, um, first is the obsession about sovereignty and territorial integrity. Um, when the Japanese defeated China in 1895, 94, 95, um, there was one uh, commissioner, uh, the Qing Dynasty commissioner, uh, by name Li Hongzhang. So the nationalist Chinese think that Li Hongzhang has given up Korean Peninsula to the Japanese and Taiwan territory to the Japanese and other areas. So they have this, uh, this concept um, since 19th century. Middle Kingdom got depleted, number one, through the Opium War, but also because there were locals who were helping the foreigners. Um, so in their in their thinking, Li Hongzhang is a traitor. Hmm? Something like Mir Kasim uh, and Jai Chan in India, hmm? in the Battle of Plassey and others. So the obsession with sovereignty and territorial integrity is because there is a fallback uh, in the domestic political discourse on Li Hongzhang phenomena. Uh, um, no Communist Party leader wants to be another Li Hongzhang. No Chinese leader wants to be named as a Li Hongzhang. Of course, you can't control situation. Taiwan, for example. If China has to wage a war on Taiwan, it could probably be a third world war hmm? because of the kind of assurances the 1979 Taiwan Relations Act passed by the US Congress it's a kind of assurance to the Taiwanese from the US leadership on protecting them, on creating conditions for stability. So you can't take Taiwan, although that is one sovereignty issue, territorial integrity issue. Second, on Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, China cannot simply take Arunachal Pradesh, hmm? unless until it wants to uh, give up uh, in terms of nuclear destruction, in terms of conventional destruction. Um, you know, there is so much industrial capacity that India has. You can't simply take Arunachal Pradesh. Hmm? Uh, you can't simply also take Senkaku Islands from Japan. Uh, posturing is fine, saying that these are mine, I want to, I want to claim these uh, or reclaim these, but there's simply no way. Saddam Hussein took two Kuwaiti oil wells hmm? in 1991. Saddam Hussein is gone, right? Today you cannot conceive of grabbing huge territories. Russia did in terms of Crimea uh, and in Georgia in later events. But those are, and it is still facing problems. Hmm? on the sanctions by the EU or other countries. So in today's world, there's no way you can have a military option grabbing such huge territory. 
Hmm? But the optimization is there because you can keep your flock together by having sovereignty, territorial integrity issues. Uh, so this is number one. Uh, I think partly explains your third question on Arunachal Pradesh as well. On the third, uh, on the second, um, Xi Jinping versus the US. Um, we saw this in 19 party Congress. The envelope has been expanded. Hmm? And this comes after China became the second largest economy. So their aspirations increased. Hmm? Uh, it came at a time when the Trump administration was following isolationist policy. So Trump, Trump walks away from TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership. Trump walks away from climate change issues. Trump threatens to walk away from WTO um, mechanism, uh, dispute resolution mechanism. Trump says he will walk away from Human Rights Council in the UN. Mm -hmm. So this happened at a time when US is following isolationist policy. So it's an opportunity for China to fill in the vacuum that the US is vacating uh, in Asia Pacific or Indo-Pacific or other areas. So they see this as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Uh, does that result in a conflict with the U.S.? Possibly not, um, because U.S. leadership today is transactional uh, in many areas, so we'll have to weigh the consequences. Uh, what I'm going to get in this transaction? So it, it is increasingly becoming, can China uh, replace the U.S. in the light of all this? I'm not very sure, because in order to replace the 1945 global order, you have to have a whole package. You need to convince the international community that this order is beneficial to you. But I'm, I have to be convinced that Chinese order is beneficial to the humankind. Hmm? But I see a problem. Um, for instance, the Chinese were bidding for the International Property Rights Council in the UN. There's a lot of opposition because China is violator of many ICRs. How can you have a chairman who is actively involved in having many uh, ICR violations back home? Hmm? So this issue raises on double standard. Um, Sir, so uh, the Chinese uh, authorities have mobilized PLA and PLAF extensively to contain and fight coronavirus. At the same time, they have also increased, at least the PLAF has increased sending its F-6 bombers around the Taiwan airspace in the last 10 days itself. So what are the Chinese trying to project to their domestic audience versus to the international audience with such moves? Uh, this is quite strange because uh, while you are trying to isolate the virus and provide medical supplies, the nation is mobilized for this. Uh, yet at the same time, they were also active in South China Sea, in Taiwan Strait, in um, <clears throat> various other places. So it sends actually a mixed signaling. Uh, but there is also some kind of legitimacy to this. When nations face flak domestically, they try to deflect this by, by uh, working on the external adversary. Hmm? Uh, so this could be one reason, we do not know. Uh, there is some escalation in Taiwan Strait in terms of crossing the median line between the two and sending these flights uh, in this area. So this could be one explanation on the, uh, on the because um, the situation in coronavirus related aspects are quite, quite acute, quite serious. Uh, so this theory applies that you want to distract the domestic audience by having a, a scenario in Taiwan state. Mm -hmm. uh, because there is, of course, after Tsai Ing-wen won the elections last month or in January, 
uh, there is some escalation in Taiwan's case. But it doesn't indicate that Taiwanese have escalated in the military or in other areas. Uh, so it doesn't warrant crossing the median line, the slight crossing the median line. Uh, so there is the, this theory explains then that nations want to distract by engaging with the external adversary. Um, so that is the only explanation one can get. Although they have been doing it, for instance, Liaoning aircraft carriers surrounded Taiwan twice, uh, and uh, the other preparations that they made in South China Sea and Taiwan Strait also indicate. Um, we did have, of course, last year, not during the virus incident, we had a Pan Kung So Lake uh, transgression in the Ladakh sector. Hmm? Uh, not as spectacular as the Doklam kind of a thing, but there is the pressure mounting on India as well on the, and that comes even after the Wuhan meeting and after the Chennai meeting between Xi Jinping and Modi. So this suggests the, uh, they were trying to uh, tell the domestic audience, we are busy with Taiwan as well, hmm? that we are not letting our guard on the, Today's talk, I would like to thank Professor Kondapalli for delivering such a wonderful, extensive and knowledge-packed lecture. As most of you know, Professor Kondapalli was my professor, and this just takes me back to the wonderful classes we had. I miss those classes. Thank you so much, sir. Um, as a token of our appreciation, I would want to uh, kindly give you this. Okay, uh, I will see you all uh, next week in class, BA and uh, MA, I will see you all on Wednesday. So thank you for joining us. <laughs>